But going into the election, I think when there's, you know, yen is a safe haven currency, going into the election, I think you'll probably see more aggressive dollar shorting yen longs. And I think we're probably around the U.S. election, we could see it go as low as 102. Hello, everyone. Welcome for another week of Markets Moving. We're really sorry about the fact that we missed last week. Sometimes we got to take a week off from our regular routine. Anyways, we're back this week. And as always, we have Joe Bordenheimer. Joe, are you there? Yes, I am. And we have a full slate today of things to, to talk about, and both for Japan and the U.S. And I think Markets Moving are going to start to surprise people. I think the emails that you sent out last week, the positions that you had were spot on, right? Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Right. Yeah, what we focused on is all the information that's being priced in the U.S., China, Japan, of course, is being influenced by it, are starting to come together and and actually starting to develop patterns. In previous um, podcasts, we discussed the idea that, you know, there was a first and second wave in the U.S., the first wave being the New York area, the second wave being a group of states that included Florida, Arizona, Texas. Now there's a third wave coming and it's increasing. And what's happening is you see a fast spike higher in new COVID cases. However, because people, I think, at hospitals and and at university hospitals especially are well-versed and they understand the sickness, they are able to handle it better. So what you're seeing in the States and in Europe now is a massive spike in COVID cases, as expected. But the number of people being hospitalized and the number of people dying is lagging quite a lot. Now, that's fantastic news, right? That's what we want to hear. But still, what's happening is as these cases spike, there's a reinitiation of some of the government regulations. And what we did was we looked at that. We saw it coming. We looked at September. We knew that markets would become heavy on it. The U.S. markets traded horribly in September, as they do every September, but it was accentuated this time by some aggressive selling. And we said, okay, fine, how do we reposition ourselves? So in the past week or two, what we looked at is some of the names that were solid names in Japan that were influenced by the sell-off in the U.S. and Europe. So uh, looking at the big names in Japan, like SoftBank or Sony, these names, we saw them for the past three weeks breaking down. We started looking at them. And some of these names obviously have more downside. But what we did was we started to reposition ourselves. And we benchmarked the Japanese Nikkei 225. We had a look at that. And looking at it over the past couple of weeks, the 23,200 down to about 22,900 was a solid support range that was tested over the said month of September. But the market started to move higher. Dollar yen has been quite stable. We saw some of these firms that had had their stocks beaten up quite badly, we saw them start to perform well. We benchmarked the index. 23,650 was that inflection point that we looked at. And as I speak now, the Nikkei is trading at 23,684, and it got up to 23,700. So what we're looking at now is a possible move higher in the index in Japan. We look at some of the blue chips We're going to revisit those names that we discussed in the past couple of months, ANA and JAL, because now that Japan itself, unlike the U.S. and Europe, and Japan as well as the broader Asian community, Singapore, Hong Kong, and of course China, they seem to be dealing with COVID quite well. And what's happening is Nikkei, as a result, China just reported GDP 4.9% for third quarter. Nikkei is performing well. The Nikkei is moving higher through that 23,650 level we spoke about. And we're looking at a broad range. We went over about 40 or 50 names that thought could be interesting in the Topics 400. And too many names to mention, but what we were looking at are names that are trading at key inflection points or key resistance levels that a lot of Japanese investors focus on. Those being the 13 and 26 week moving averages, as well as the 25 and 75 day moving averages. And what I think could happen over the next week or two, and that's why I think this today's podcast is exceptionally important for all of us, is we've waited, TK, we've discussed it, and we've looked at these names for three weeks. I think what we should be focusing on is as the U.S. election comes up, people are going to you know, see that the U.S. has got a lot of issues to deal with. I think the U.S. market might struggle a bit. But what's going to become transparently obvious is Japan and China are doing very well. And as a result, you'll see the Nikkei probably move higher. You'll see this larger group of names that we like a lot 
these 40 or 50 names in the topics uh, 400, they will probably perform very well. So going forward, we think that the performance of Nikkei could go to 24,500 or even 25,350. That's my ultimate target by the end of the year. That being the case, we'll look at these 400 names. We'll look at their breakouts in these 25 and 75 day moving averages. Some are trading at key Fibonacci levels. And we're also looking at the Ichimoku cloud charts. These indicate that some of these names could break out quite aggressively. Do you also want to talk about the Topics Big 70 and Topics Mid 400s? Yeah. So the Big 70 are some of the names that we look at. We're looking at performance. We'll come up with some more specifics on our next call. But the Mid 70, the Copix Core 30, as you know, the Core 30 is a group of names, all the big blue chips in Japan. Those are indicators we look at, at outside of the Nikkei 225, which is 23,650 is our pivot level. We're going to look at those names, especially the Core 30 and the Topix 70. Those will be indicators that we'll focus on. And the way they're trading, they look quite firm right now. The overall market could be moving higher, just, you know, our view. And tying in with China, and I think there's a pivot that we have to, an underlying pivot that we have to start acknowledging. Given the fact that COVID is not going away, and we've seen some setbacks in some of the vaccine discussions out of the U.S. and Europe, it's becoming very clear that China and Japan are handling the COVID situation much better. That being the case, if they are handling it better, then what I think will happen is they will continue to see their markets move higher. And Japan will probably see a pivot in 2020 and 2021, a pivot away from its the stronger influence of the U.S. and probably plug into a more of an influence out of China and China growth, as well as broad Asia growth. So to your question, we'll be focusing over the next couple of weeks on the topic score 30 the topic 70, and that broad list of topics 400. We've put together about 40 or 50 names, and we'll mention those names in our next podcast. There are lots of them. I think, you know, a lot of people's minds right now, especially during this period, is the election in the U.S. Now, is there going to be a different relationship if Trump wins versus Biden for Japan? I don't think there's going to be a lot for Japan. I think the relationship between the United States and Japan has always been solid, and it really doesn't change a lot, whether it's a a Democratic administration or a Republican administration. Now, Trump obviously has a strong relationship with Japan. It was with Prime Minister Abe, who just left after a fantastic nine and a half years. But what I think will happen is even if Trump loses and we have a Democrat in power, I think what they're going to try to do is try to, especially for Japan and China, is keep things normal or try to improve relations. And probably the better point is, will the Biden administration have a better relationship with China? Probably the answer is yes. What I think is the more pressing and short-term issue would be, no matter who's elected on November 3rd, and one point I want to make, people say it's going to drag on for weeks or months. I don't think that's the case. I think what's happening is there's going to be enough information in the first 24 to 48 hours to call a clear victor. Biden is ahead in some of the swing states in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida. Those are really important states. The person who wins those four states, especially Florida, Pennsylvania, to a lesser extent, Wisconsin, Michigan, those are the core states in the swing states that must be won to take it. And still, I think Biden's ahead by somewhere between two and four points in those states. Biden gets in. What I think happens is just a reopening of schools and reopening of the economy. And if Trump gets in, I think there'll be a little more pushback, but it'll probably eventually happen. And I think a lot of people are looking forward to the election, not only to who wins, but to after the election, knowing that there'll be a more more normalization of the U.S. economy. So regardless of who wins, I think the U.S. short term will probably see the market go higher. But there are a lot of concerns about the spread of COVID and what could happen when they, we have a harsh winter in November, December, and January. You know, the other good indicator is the USD JPY for the market anyways. And you felt that, you know, it was overextended, sort of triggering a, a dollar short cover rally. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think the dollar yen has been a big currency pair that a lot of people look at both domestically here in Japan and, and globally. And there's a lot of talk and been a lot of research produced in the past three or four months 
about the dollar weakness and dollar yen possibly going to 98 or 95. Some people saying it's going lower. But what I think is happening is people are getting crowded, very aggressively crowded into the short dollar long at yen position. That seems to be the talk on the street. And for that, my focus would be, and here's where another trade idea comes into play. If dollar yen goes down to 100 or 98, it'll imply that people are getting short dollars. And, we, and I see this overextension of shortness in dollars quite a lot in the past month. You'll have a snapback rally. So let's say people are looking at dollar yen now and they're shorting dollars. I think what will happen is the shortage of dollars will trigger a snapback rally. And it's trading 105.37 now. Again, a move towards 102 would probably see people increasing their dollar shorts. But here's where I think it could impact Japan. If we see it snap back to 106 or 10650, which I think is probably the case if people can get, continue to get crowded in shorts, you'll probably see the names like auto names like Nissan, Toyota, Suzuki Motors. Those names could start to perform well because the, the weaker yen would probably influence those names. Interesting. So what's your target for USDJPY? I think over the next week, I think we see it's 102. 536, I think we see 106 to 10650 over the next week. But going into the election, I think when there's, you know, yen is a safe haven currency, going into the election, I think you'll probably see more aggressive dollar shorting yen longs. And I think we're probably around the U.S. election, we could see it go as low as 102, maybe 101. And I think that's okay. where we're going. What I think we could look at in that context is focus more on the, the exporters. Yen weakness, we want to see, you know, and again, if, if we see yen weakness, it's going to improve some of the positions in these exporter stocks. Do you think if Biden wins, would there be any changes to the market for the last two months and a couple of weeks of Trump's administration versus if Trump wins? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's probably the most important question. And it comes in contextual in several layers. If Biden wins and the Republicans keep the Senate and nothing changes in the House, then I think short term, in the next month or two, equity still trades pretty much the same. The U.S. equity market stays firm or goes slightly lower. But if there's a blue wave, if we see the Democrats take the House, which they have already, they improve their strength in the House, if they take the Senate and the White House, a blue wave across all parts of the government, I think equity will collapse. Because what's going to happen is you're going to see a very aggressive move towards raising taxes. You're going to see some of the more far left ideas come into play. I think what Biden will have to do is probably listen to the voices of the left more and a lot of the squad and the younger people in the party who are very aggressively going after people who are wealthy and obviously want to tax them. So a Biden win against Trump with no other changes, equity pretty much stays the same, maybe just slower. If it's a blue wave, I think equity could take a hard hit. And, you know, we could see the U.S. indices down 8, 10, 12 percent very quickly. Okay. That sounds great. So what would be the best thing for some investors to do right now? Should they stay in cash or should they go long Japanese stocks? Yeah, I think what people should be doing is, I think, if you know, focus more on the Nikkei, if uh, 23,650 breaks on the upside with momentum and we see continued increase in volume, which implies more participation for both domestic and international players, I think the Nikkei 225 could break away from the U.S. decouple and we could see 25,350 by the end of the year. That being the case, you want to focus on some of these big exporter names because they will be back in fashion. China's seeing some growth. And we'll probably see these mid-400 that we discussed perform quite well. So I say, regardless of what happens in the U.S. election, I think Japan decouples. I think DK225 goes higher. And we mentioned that the topics Big 70 and the topics Core 30, we'll be focusing on those names. If those sub-indices, sub-indexes perform well, we'll probably see Japan equity perform quite well. One other thing I want to throw in is we've talked for weeks and months about the Japanese airlines, uh, 9202 yep. and 9201, both JAL and ANA. There's talk now, over the past weekend, there was a lot of talk in the Japanese community, my friends, just socializing over dinner, that in the next month or so, there'll be an opening up for flights, 
for international flights for some of the Japanese carriers, the two main carriers. And they'll be able to travel through Asia and travel to even Hawaii. That being the case, those stocks have been beaten down recently. I just checked them. They're both up about one and a half percent today. But that talk over the weekend is, is even on the news. And a lot of my friends, my wife's friends are talking about it. So if we do see a sudden increase in travel, especially overseas, those stocks could perform very well. And I would suggest to our listeners to pull up a chart and have a look and study those and, and consider those over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I, you know, I always find these stocks to be, you know, sort of threshold stocks where, you know, if it's still below a certain threshold, meaning the travel, the number of people traveling or number of destinations that the flights are going to is still below a certain threshold, it's really hard for these companies to operate in a profitable manner, right? So even if you have like, I would say 20% of the markets open up for these flights to fly to or 30%, it's a good indicator that we're going in the right direction. But, you know, given what you've seen with COVID-19 over the last year, you know, COVID can come and it can go and policies can change literally overnight. As you can see, many European countries or Asian countries right now have have clamped down or locked down or even Australia. So, you know, do you think that these airlines could get to a point in the near term where they can surpass this threshold where they can be profitable again or at least breaking even? That's a great question. I think what happens is as the world reopens, as we move to economic normalization across many countries, I still believe that Asia is leading the world. And by that, I mean, in terms of handling COVID, China, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Japan handle it quite well. And it could be, it could be that we see Japan opening a lot of flights to Singapore, Beijing, Hong Kong, maybe Hawaii, because it's somewhat isolated from the mainland in the U.S., but probably fewer flights to Europe in the U.S. and more throughout Asia, which, again, we have to reexamine the threshold. And if we see robust flights from Tokyo to Beijing to Singapore to Hong Kong, that might be enough to get these stocks much higher. Cool. All right, buddy. Thank you very much for your time today. I, I appreciate it. I hope everyone likes what we're putting out there. If you like it, please subscribe. Click the subscribe button down there. If you want to get notified every time we post a new podcast out there, please click the bell as well as like us and you know let us know if there's something you want us to talk about. Again, please subscribe. Thank you very much and appreciate all your time and support. Thank you. All right. See you. Bye.